race relations getting better? Right now, it doesn't feel like it. What are Christians to do? Let's talk about it with Bishop Herb Andrew on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. That's the name of the program, and I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. We are so glad that you're here. You always have a place at our table or, as it were, in the living room of our homes from which we are all broadcasting. Our favorite mega church pastor, Zach Van Dyke, is here. Zach, I understand you recently set up a bird feeder on your window. How did that go? Uh, it was great. Uh, the birds came, and then at night, we had about five rats in it. Uh, so it turned terrifying. <laughs> did the rats eat the birds? Uh, maybe. 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 <laughs> it just seems typical for 2020, man. <laughs> it's life. so true. Matthew Porter's with us, too. Matthew spent yesterday at a theme park with a mask on. He's now ready to live as a hermit, right? I, I'm done. I'm done. Outside was fun while it lasted. That was so hot. I never want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that way the first time I went to a theme park years ago. In my opinion, has not varied subsequent to that first time. <laughs> Our producer, Jinx, is working hard in the little glass booth. Jinx, do you know? You, you know, uh, you know, don't you, that the barber shops have been opened up again? <laughs> what's a, you what's might a want to take note of that. <laughs> now, I wear a hat. <laughs> I wear a hat one day and you freak out. Do you still want me to get a haircut? <laughs> I would. I don't, I have, would, I don't uh, have the be shape of the head if for you that. got a haircut. The electrical I keep light looking at you and through. thinking of Jesus, and that's a good thought. Look, some people have the perfect skull for, for short or no hair. I don't. I've got a big <laughs> the, beak in the back of my head that you don't want to see. <laughs> that hurt, but it's okay because I love you, Jinx. Our video director, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. As our IT guy, John fixes problems we don't see in ways we will never understand. <laughs> and Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George believes there are two rules for success. Number one, don't tell everything you know. And Kathy is the <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got to is to repeat that. that. I had Did to I miss the, I missed the second one. I was waiting for that. Well, the first one is don't tell everything you know. Yeah. <laughs> and that makes sense when you say nothing about the second one. It loses something in an explanation. Just a little. Trust me, people we, have to explain things to me, and I know that. <laughs> we just totally killed Matthew's joke there. Like, we made it not <laughs> Took funny. most of the morning, guys. <laughs> right. All right. good. <laughs> and Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. Be on the lookout for Kathy's new cookbook, Irresistible Taste, <laughs> Recipes for the Reformed. <laughs> Sounds good. When will it be out, Kathy? Well, if this pandemic continues, it could be a lot sooner than I thought. <laughs> of I got a lot of free time on my hands. You think we can get Kathy on the show for an interview? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll interview you when your there you book go. comes out. And speaking of interviews, um, our guest today is one of our favorite people. We love this man. Uh, you can go to our website and check out the Grace Conferences. He spoke at those conferences with great power and wisdom and depth. He began his ministry at the age of 30 and preached his first sermon in 1993. In 2001, Herb received a Bachelor of Arts degree and then went on for further education. He's released several powerful audio series and video series. You ought to check out Kingdom First Ministries. 
and he's a broadcaster and currently serves as pastor of Beacon Light Baptist Church in Homa, Louisiana. Herb, am I pronouncing right. that right? You got it right. I'm 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 impressed, Steve. <laughs> I Listen, didn't even I tell have it. enough I southern impressed. genes in me to do it right. <laughs> yes, sir. We appreciate you and you're taking your time to come on with us. These are hard times. And if uh, you're a Christian and these times don't break your heart, something's wrong. Uh, the problem is that it's hard to get in the skin of another person, mm -hmm. even if they're your same race. But it's really hard to understand across racial boundaries. And because the bishop is um, incredibly insightful and gentle and kind and wise and biblical and orthodox, um, we decided to go to him and to sit down and to, uh, and to talk and listen and maybe have a conversation about what's going on. Herb, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for for the invitation. I'm very excited about uh, sharing with you guys today. Uh, uh, miss you guys since the Grace Conference. It's it's been way too long, but um, we we are we are um, we are in the midst of some very, 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 very challenging times. Some very, very challenging times. Herb, you've been around for a good while. I mean, you mm -hmm. didn't start this yesterday. So you've seen some really bad stuff and maybe even some really good stuff. You certainly have seen some changes. I wish you'd talk to us a little bit about some of the things that are happening. Herb lives in the deep south and uh, most of us are southerners. Well, when, when, um, you know, when, as, as a, as a as a black man who um, who has uh, two black sons, um, two uh, grandsons as well, uh, you know, I, I'm very very concerned. I'm, I'm very concerned. Um, not fearful. Uh, not fearful because um, I, I really believe that that um, God covers. God covers uh, uh, my kids. I plead the blood of Jesus over my family. Daily, so I'm really not concerned um, that something um, tragic will happen to any of my kids, any of my family members. But I'm concerned because there's so many others out there who who may not um, who may not have have a covering uh, that that will speak and that will apply the protection of God over their over their loved ones and and um, experience. Uh, uh, things such as uh, Mr. Floyd experienced on last week, um, you know, personally, um, as I as I uh, watch that, I'm, I'm normally I'm, I'm usually very good at processing things um, without becoming overly emotional. Uh, but I, I must confess that as I watched and observed what happened to this this man, um, it, it literally broke my heart over these last over these last two weeks. I probably have cried more over these last two weeks than I have in a long time in a long time. And um, the tears are, are not are not again. It's not necessarily um, uh, tears of um, hopelessness because I, I'm a believer that there's always hope. And I, I believe that um, even as as we have made changes to this point, uh, the, 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 problem, the problem, I believe, lies in the fact that the changes only come as, um, as behavior modification. And, and as long as all we're doing is, is, is changing behavior because of outward pressure, that change will never be lasting. The change that we need right now um, you know, I, I believe it's going to take a holistic effort. There's, there's no one component of our community that's going to effectively uh, be able to bring about the kind of change uh, that we need. And when, when, when all of us, when all of us begin to respect each other's 
uh, the role that we have to play in this, um, when we understand that these protesters, these activists, we may not like them, uh, we may not like the fact that they're out there, but they are needed. They are needed. They are so needed. Um, and, and of course, I, I, I'm speaking of the peaceful protesters. Um, so, so you know, they're, they're needed. And, and not only are they needed, there, there are other segments of the, of the community that, that all must come together in, in order to uh, bring about and facilitate uh, the type of change uh, that, that I believe each of us uh, desire and the type of change that I know God would desire to see uh, in this world. You know, I wish, I wish that the whole world could hear what you're saying. I think that's so wise, outward change that is forced, uh, whichever way it goes, uh, doesn't last and isn't good. And when we come back after the break, I want to talk to you some more about that. I believe we Christians have something that is needed desperately as a part of this conversation. But we're not cool anymore. So people don't listen so much anymore. And that's sad, almost sadder than the riots and the racism and the division and the hatred. But we'll continue the conversation on the other side of the break. And if you go anywhere, before we get back, you're crazy. Steve Brown, et cetera, and we're talking with Bishop Herb Andrew. You can follow him, by the way, on Twitter at Pastor, but Pastor spelled funny. It's P A S T R, no O, Herb Andrew. And you can uh, Google the church and you can Google his videos. And uh, Kathy was saying before we went on the air that she's been watching them almost every day and has almost, but not quite, become a Christian. <laughs> and uh, Herb said that he would fix it today. And uh, we <laughs> no promises. I no will lead <laughs> Kathy smart man right before the, what? <laughs> I said smart. He said no promises. I said smart man. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, uh, yeah, Bishop. Before the break, you made a really uh, powerful observation about the difference between changing behavior and and changing hearts. That seems relevant when it comes to kind of the online discourse that we're seeing. It's it's an interesting thing because when you see kind of ugly uh, points of view and, and hateful statements there's a large part of us that goes, no, I don't want to hear that. You guys need to keep that quiet. But there's another part of in my a secondary thought where I'm like, you know what? No, if that's what you believe on a, on a certain level, I want to hear it because I want to know where you are and, 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 and where you're coming from. Not that I, I think, not that I agree with anything, but I feel like if there's an unpopular opinion, we shouldn't suppress it. We should, engage it when we're able to is there anything to that well i i believe i believe that you're you're on to something matt uh matthew because um you know we're, we're living we live we live in a world of political correctness so 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 you know when people get angry oftentimes now you're really hearing what they really believe and how they really feel and um i i agree wholeheartedly i don't i don't want if I'm questioned about any situation or even if I'm making a statement about it, I don't want I don't want to. I am not going to give you what I think you want to hear. I, I, I believe that um, in order for a real conversation to take place, uh, you, you, you would benefit from knowing exactly how I feel about uh, any given situation. So uh, the fact that um, uh, ugly things may be said and. And um, 
the fact that uh, aggressive statements may be made. Um, you know, we may not agree with them, but we have to honor. Uh, we have to honor. Um, we have to honor the feelings of those who make those statements. Mm -hmm. And and when you when you look at when you look at what we're dealing with right now, you know, I, I my, one one of my one of my biggest concerns is is I understand that America is a Christian a Christian nation. It's a Christian nation. And and being that America is a Christian nation, I begin to look at this and I begin to think from the perspective of um, even statistics from last year. Statistics from last year indicate that 65% of Americans are, 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 are professing Christianity. So that's 65 out of every 10 people say they're Christians. And that's the decline in number. So, so you would figure 10 years ago, that number was even higher. So that would, that would suggest that, that 10 years ago, seven out of every 10 Americans profess Christianity. So with that being said, that would say to me that this, what we're dealing with, Mr. Floyd, he's not the first. This stuff has been going on for years. This stuff has been going on for, for quite some time. And because it's been going on so long, and because so many of us profess to be Christians, now, for me, it turns, the, it turns my attention to the church. Because if, if seven out of 10 Americans are Christians, then that would suggest that some of the perpetrators of some of the ugly things that we've seen, some of them have done this claiming Christianity as their, as, uh, claiming, claiming Jesus as their savior. And I, I don't question anybody's salvation, but the point I'm making is that goes to what we're teaching in our churches. Because what we're teaching in our churches is obviously bringing about behavior modification and is not touching our hearts. The only thing that can touch a man's heart, I, I've, I've learned this over the years and I've seen it experienced. The only thing that can touch a man's heart is the true gospel of grace. Mm -hmm. Not going in that Bible, trying to figure out what I need to do to be considered good, but going in that Bible to find out and understand what Jesus has already done for me to make me good. Mm -hmm. And as I get a revelation, the Bible says it in, in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 3 and 18, I believe. See, see we, we, we keep going for, for this, this outward change. Man, if our churches, and this is what breaks my heart, it, it, you know, what breaks my heart, the bottom line is some change is going to come. Uh, some change is going to come. The protesters, uh, the politicians, it, it's, it's, it, change is being forced. But here's the key. Here's the key. Is that going to be real change? Is that going to be real change? Second Corinthians 3 and 18 says it like this, that if we with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord, who is the glory of the Lord? That's Jesus. He says, then as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are then transformed into that image of Jesus that we're seeing. But it's not being done by our efforts it's an inward transformation, the Bible says, that takes place by the Holy Spirit from glory to glory. So if, if we as pastors, and this, this, this is who I'm pleading with, I'm pleading with the pastors. If we as pastors, especially, and, 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 and hopefully we can deal with this further along, but especially my white brothers, we got to make sure that we are lifting up Jesus before people. Hmm. Not not telling, not making people believe that because your business is successful, you're a good Christian. Because you pay your tithes, you're a good Christian. Well, that means I could pay my tithes, consider myself a good Christian, and then put my knee in a man's neck hmm. until he dies. Because, because my actions of tithing in Christianity says I'm good, but my heart hasn't been changed. Hmm. And if we lift up Jesus... We, we've gotten we've gotten too creative. We've gotten too creative in our pulpits. Paul says, I'm afraid that that just like the serpent deceived Eve, he said, I'm afraid that 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 you all have been deceived as well from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. It all goes back to putting Jesus back in his place. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. 
that's not good, good stuff <laughs> and very uncomfortable stuff too uh, you know if you think that your business is going well and that makes you a good christian or you tithe or you pick it and protest or if you hurt people that you think are hurting others uh, and politically, all of that, they'll make you feel self-righteous. Only Jesus will make you feel the way you ought to feel. We're needy and we're sinful. And without him, no change takes place except that which is forced on the outside. Hey guys, don't go away. We're with Bishop Andrew, and this is good stuff. and we're talking to Bishop Herb Andrew and we love this guy. We love him because uh, of not only what he preaches, a wonderful preacher, but he gets this stuff down deep and it blows me away. He's a friend of Key Life and the pastor of Beacon Light Baptist Church in, <clears throat> in Uma, Louisiana. You did it better the first time, Steve. I know. <laughs> you did. Give it on the internet. I worked pause on there. it, and I just, all right, <laughs> say it again for me, Herb, and I'll. Homa. 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 No right. one Homa. I'll never forget it again. It <laughs> been there? For another 15 minutes. <laughs> Zach? Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, I want to hear you just say the word glory over and over again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's some power in that word. Um, Hallelujah. Um, I... You know, um, I, I so agree with uh, with what you're saying about at, at churches. We we can we can be so tempted as pastors to take the behavior modification route because people leave the sermon feeling like, "Oh, you gave me what to do this week," and thank you, Pastor. That was very practical. And uh, and for some reason, uh, sometimes when you preach grace over and over again, if people can say like, I'm ready for you to move on to like the practical thing. Right. Um, and so I so agree. Like there, there's, uh, there's so much to uh, us as pastors, like preaching Jesus and preaching him every week, uh, to our people. Um, and, and I guess my question is, um, as a, as a white preacher, um, I, it, about three years ago, it, it hit me, um, that, um, that I was in some ways oblivious, to a lot of um, a lot of the um, the extent of racism in our in our in our country, because I thought, well, I love people and I want to be kind to everyone, and you know we're all equal at the foot of the cross, and um, and you know racism is like those people, and um, and and I was really convicted, realizing that that's that's not the case, and and so I began to just kind of read and listen, and I realized that all my theological influences up to that point had been old dead white guys and, um, and how much like I missed out on not, um, having, uh, other brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, who are different than me kind of speak into my understanding of God and grace. And, um, and, and I guess my question is if we get grace, shouldn't that free us up to be able to look at how racist things are, or like, like we, we don't, we know, like what you were saying, we know that left to our own devices, we are going to do evil. We are going to perpetuate racism. Um, and, the, and the gospel of grace frees us to actually acknowledge that um, without feeling like um, there's no hope, right? Mm -hmm. It does. It does. And, and, and I, I, believe that, I believe that grace is so powerful uh, because, because it, it literally... It literally takes it takes away um, it takes all of the self effort out of the picture. Mm -hmm. When 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 you really when we really get an understanding of of, of the grace of Jesus Christ um, of what it is He has done, it 
grace grace begins to supernaturally do something to you on the inside. I, I'll put it to you like this. Think about it. Think about it. Um, because I, I run into the same thing um, I did several years, well, not several years ago, several months ago, um, because I began preaching. I preached nothing but Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Lord told me at the beginning of 2018, he said, from this moment forward, I want you to preach nothing but Jesus. No more three steps to doing this, four <laughs> steps to doing that. He says, just uncover Jesus. And what I've discovered is that in doing so, in doing so, I see more, I see, I see our people being more productive, but their production is not, is not forced production. Because because there was there was a time within our ministry where where people were were doing things in the ministry, but they were doing things in the ministry because they felt as though the more they did, the more spiritual they were. But what grace does, it puts all of us on an even even kill. If I do or if I don't, I'm still spiritual because it's not based on my actions; it's based on what Jesus has done. And 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 as I begin as I begin to flow in grace. Now, I'm no longer operating by the letter. I'm operating by the spirit. And here's the deal. When you operate by the spirit, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. When he came, he didn't lose any of who he is. So now you don't have to tell me to love people. You don't have to tell me don't murder a man. I, 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 have, I have the Holy Spirit on the inside of me and all of his fruits. So I have love in my heart. So with love in my heart, you don't have to tell me don't don't hurt a man because the love that's in me will will push me to want to do it. Not because somebody is looking, but it'll push me to want to do it because I'm being transformed into the image of Jesus that's presented to me every week. Mm. And oh. that's that's our challenge. That's good stuff. And not only does it do that, it uh, takes away the need to have barriers you don't have to defend yourself anymore. No. You don't have to pretend to be something you aren't. And you can do kind of what Zach was talking about. You can open your life to input from places that aren't normal. Right. That aren't you. That aren't defined in the way you define things. Uh, once grace starts, you don't have anything to protect. You don't have it. You, have, you don't have to pretend anymore. You know that if anything happens, it's Jesus that does it. Already covered. Yeah, and it's covered. That's right. We're talking with Bishop Herb Andrew, and you don't want to miss a bit of this. to introduce friends to friends. And uh, you're getting a chance to meet uh, Bishop Andrew, and and uh, you're beginning to see one of the reasons why we love him so much. He so smells like Jesus. And, you know, he can say harsh things, and he can say it in such a way and with such gentleness and the spirit can apply it in such a magnificent way. And he's doing that for us today. Uh, Bishop, I um, obviously am, am a white girl and I, uh, I grew up in a white church. I think we had one black family in our church. Um, and that was a long, long, long time ago. And one of the great things uh, that came out of the grace conferences that we did those two years was um, meeting you and also Bishop McClendon as well, and listening to the two of you uh, talk and share things that um, were, were so simple sometimes and so logical, and yet I had never, ever once thought about it uh, because my my thinking 
has been a white girl in a white church, uh, you know, my, my whole life. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm thinking right now, just specifically of Christians and white Christians. Is there, is there, is there a particular, I'm sure there's not just one, but is there, are there one or two particular misconceptions that we as white believers have um, about what the black experience really is, because I think we think that we are better than pagans are than white pagans because we love Jesus. So we want to do better, but there's obviously something that we don't know a lot of things that we don't know, but is there something specific that you, you know, if you had the ability to just like pronounce some kind of benediction or something, and there would be this sudden awareness that, that we would say, well, of course, you know, um, but that we just don't get because we haven't had that experience. Well, you know, um, with with um, just dealing with with law enforcement, and you think in terms of law enforcement as as a as a white girl growing up in a white community, um, you know, the, the, the police in your community were you, you may have known them my name. Officer so and so, that was your friend. They they were they were. I mean, you see the police coming in, and a smile come across your face because because you know they are there to protect you and to serve you. But and it's and it's hard. It's hard when 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 you have dealt with officer so and so, and they've been so kind and so gentle and so loving to you. It's it's hard for you to imagine that these same officers are treating another group of individuals in a totally different manner. Because, because coming up, even as a kid, uh, as a kid, police, uh, law enforcement for us has always, it, it, it has never been something pleasant. It has always been, uh, you know, it, it has always been something that we, that we, well, you know, looked at through the side of our eyes because, because of the various things that we experienced in our communities that, that, you guys could never ever even imagine and it was done and it was being done on a consistent basis so so when you see when you when you see the anger when you see the anger and the hurt and the disappointment um, of individuals even these guys who are protesting and let me just say something about these protesters because they are exercising their legal right to protest I am all for the peaceful protesting the rioting um, I, I think all of us on this panel, uh, we, we have to be smart enough to understand that that a certain percentage of those who are creating trouble are not those who are in the midst of the protest. They are there for that purpose, to create trouble and, and to discredit the protest. But but these people, when you when you see their anger and you see their hurt, I guess what, what as a black man. And, and I don't know how easy it is for you to do this, but if you could step outside of. Of, of where you are and not see it from your perspective. But 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 just, you know, when you when you hear a person, you know, pull you over. I mean, I, I got. Oh, thank you. I was coming from church, coming from a communion service, driving my vehicle in a collar, in a collar. I'm in a collar coming from church, driving my vehicle that I reported a month ago stolen. But in that month, I recovered the vehicle. And my, it may have been my mistake. I never called and told them that, that the vehicle has been recovered. So now I'm driving from communion with my collar on and the police, the police pull in front of me and in behind me. I have a collar on, I have a badge with my name, I have my driver's license, and I have in the car the registration with all of my information. And with a collar on, the police have me handcuffed mm. up against a car. Mm. Like I stole a car. Now, 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 had I been a white guy, they would have been father, father, this, father, that, father, oh, let's let's take. But even after looking in the glove compartment and pulling out my registration, seeing my license, seeing me in a collar. I have now some of the uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, they've stopped, they're watching, 
they still have me in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. And so what I would desire more than anything is for you all to be able to step outside and, and imagine what would, how would you feel about that? How would you feel about that, Pastor Zach? You a pastor with a collar on. Mm. How would you feel about that? And so, so those are the type of things that, that we experience. Now, wait a minute, y'all. I had a collar on. Mm. And that's how I was treated. Oh, so man. think about the young fella with his pants hanging down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, so that I guess, I guess to answer your question, Kathy, the thing I would want more than anything is for for you guys to just just empathize with the fact that we're not being treated the way you all are. Mm -hmm. And I'm not uh, I'm not saying that crying. I'm just saying it as a reality. I'm so sorry. I wish I lived in your parish uh, because there needs to be. And I know the Jesus thing is at the heart of it. But somebody needs to say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what's going on right now. That is. These protests. Yeah. That is exactly what's that's going that. on. That is exactly what's going on. But. Um, oh, Herb. I hate for this to come to an end. It's uh, been so good. And as always, you okay. smell like Jesus. I'm so glad you're around. Herb won't tell you, but I'm going to tell you <laughs> when he saw Floyd being killed, different than a lot of people, uh, the bishop uh, wasn't angry, he cried. And that's kind of what Jesus would do, I think. Herb, can we do this again? Sure. Let's have a follow up after this dust settles a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah let's. Let's do yes, it. Yes, definitely. All yeah, right, okay. we'll, so don't go anywhere, okay? You get the <laughs> hives. <laughs>
that are on everybody's mind right now. And as uh, Bishop Andrew said, get on your knees, go to Jesus and say, I'm here. I'm not much, but I'm yours. Open my eyes. Let me see you more and then love the people to whom you sent me in a better and uh, deeper way. Got to go, guys. We're going to come back same time, same place next week. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't do. (laughs) And that gives you a wide, wide berth.